Stan Tatkin, Psy DMFT, is a clinician, researcher, teacher, and developer of a psychobiological approach to couple therapy, PACT. He has a clinical practice in Calabasas and developed the PACT Institute for the purpose of training other psychotherapists to use this method in their clinical practice. In addition, Dr. Tatkin teaches and supervises family, medical, family medicine residents at Kaiser Permanente Woodland Hills and is an assistant clinical professor at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, Department of Family Medicine. He is on the board of directors of Lifespan Learning Institute and serves as a member on Relationships First Council, a nonprofit organization founded by Harville Hendricks and Helen McKelly Hunt. He's written a number of books, including Your Brain on Love, The Neurobiology of Healthy Relationships. It's actually a six CD set. Wired for Love, How Understanding Your Partner's Brain and Attachment Style Can Help You Diffuse Conflict and Build a Secure Relationship. Love and War and Intimate Relationships, Connection, Disconnection, and Mutual Regulation in Couples Therapy. <coughs> so he's trained in Gestalt, and we're very pleased to have Dr. Tatkin here. How many people here work with couples? Oh, good, great. How many of the, you love working with couples? <laughs> good. All right, that's, that's, that's good to know. All right, so um, th uh, this is a, uh, uh, a polytheoretical, nonlinear approach uh, to working with couples or individuals or groups or families or ducks or dogs. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, let me just tell you my background uh, in addiction, just it's a short cred list. Uh, I uh, was one of the original um, uh, lead therapist for John Bradshaw back in the day uh, when there was such a thing as codependency, uh, hospitalization for codependency. Um, that was, uh, that ended of, as we probably know. Uh, and so did, uh, so did uh, dedicated programs for drug and alcohol, mostly uh, dual diagnosis after that. And so I was, uh, uh, I was there through three hospitals with Bradshaw and then I became director of Charter Hospital's intensive outpatient program until it closed. Um, I kind of have this, this uh, thing, I'm not sure, uh, where every hospital I've worked has closed. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that there's a connection there. Uh, I'm still at Kaiser and I've been working with family medicine residents for 20 years now. Um, <coughs> and that's been uh, a sheer uh, pleasure. So I wanted uh, to talk a bit about addictions as something um, more complex uh, uh, than maybe has been talked about, maybe not. Um, addiction as being only part of the problem, um, get into a little bit of the neurobiology of addiction, which you probably already know about. Attachment predictions for addiction, uh, and we could spend a, a lot longer on that. Arousal regulation predilections for addiction, uh, that's another piece here in terms of arousal uh, states and arousal strategies for self-care. And then treatment strategies for dealing with addiction in couple therapy. And it, it turns out a lot of good data uh, that couple therapy is um, one of the best modalities for treating addiction. Uh, uh, so addiction, only part of the problem. Um, I'm acknowledging uh, the, the strong role of the mesolimbic area, the ventral te tegmental uh, area, the nucleus accumbens, and basically the reward um, uh, tract. Uh, and genetics, uh, the diathesis of addiction, uh, having a genetic uh, a component, but also an environmental stress component. Um, and also uh, it, it reaches back into attachment and arousal regulation in terms of managing oneself. And I will get to the four uh, arousal uh, strategies as we move along here. So um, uh, again, mesolimbic structures, uh, particularly uh, dopamine uh, and uh, the GABA system. Um, I'm also gonna cover just a little bit the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, um, uh, the dorsal lateral um, prefrontal cortex and its role in uh, dealing with addictions and uh, bending reality and also the reality ego. And the temporal uh, uh, parietal junction just a little bit having to do uh, now with theory of mind. So master regulators in terms of error and error correction uh, um, are many. 
um, higher cortical regions, the anterior cingulate, the anterior insula, um, the ventral medial prefrontal bundle, um, and uh, the orbital frontal area, which is part of that, um, and the dorsolateral. Um, these are areas that are, um, are known to uh, up and down regulate lower limbic structures, but also um, uh, allow us to do things that are pennywise pound foolish um, and allow us to bend reality uh, in a, a manner that is uh, consistent with a pleasure-seeking or pain-avoiding ego. So here, um, uh, I don't have a video. I don't know why that's there. This is an old slide. Um, but uh, I, you know, I'm going to pass on this because I think most everybody really understands, probably, uh, if, if all of you are uh, involved in addiction medicine. How many people are not? Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, so you know, wi with, with behavioral addictions and uh, substance use, uh, there is a, a role in this mesolimbic area, um, uh, the reward circuit, that engages... Uh, when, uh, when people are experiencing extraordinary um, uh, levels of excitement, dopaminergic excitement, but also anxiolytic effects of the GABA system. And, uh, and that is a really cool experience. Um, everybody in this room has had it. Uh, if you've fallen in love, that, uh, the very same circuit is employed. Um, and actually part of a problem with opiate use is that there's a massive downregulation of dopamine receptors. And uh, people who are, um, who are strong opiate users actually have a hard time falling in love, actually have a hard time feeling love because of the downregulation of that system and, uh, and the replacement of that experience through the use of drugs. So uh, this will happen uh, in any uh, sense with uh, uh, anything from uh, late night eating uh, to my favorite ice cream, uh, uh, drugs, alcohol, pornography, gambling, uh, you name it, anything can become an addiction. And, um, but there's a role here also of the, uh, of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex um, in uh, playing uh, a part in uh, being hijacked by lower limbic circuits, lower limbic areas. And that becomes a problem when you have a, uh, 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 a sort of an ambassador in the brain sense an ambassador system that, uh, that is a master regulator, uh, error corrector, and predictor being co-opted by limbic areas. Um, and uh, we may convince ourselves that what we are doing is good. Um, it was part of the addiction cycle. This is a good idea to eat this ice cream uh, just before going to bed, uh, only to wake up the next morning and realize that was a big mistake. So th we have a problem of frontal areas being uh, hijacked by uh, lower limbic circuits. And this is true, by the way, of all acting out. Uh, acting out plays a huge role in all of therapy, more than people probably realize. And uh, the acting out behavior is a kind of reward in that I do something to feel better at the cost of getting better. Uh, <coughs> I, I am impulsively driven to uh, relieve pain in the moment or to seek pleasure. And that, uh, that allows me to bend reality, which of course has consequences such as becoming more and more crazy. Uh, there's no free lunch, right? Uh, the more that I bend reality, act out, the, uh, the lesser hold I have on a reality ego that allows me to do the right thing. And in this case, I'm pointing to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which, by the way, is compromised by certain sugars and fats, fats like junk food, uh, drugs and alcohol compromised. And so that is the do the right thing area uh, where it overrides uh, this uh, uh, feeling of wanting to do something uh, and not looking forward to what is the right thing or the best thing to do for myself. That is our discipline, that is our, uh, our being able to think ahead, and of course a strong reality ego, executive function, is seminal to having a real self uh, with healthy self-entitlements, being able to plan ahead to be able to put off rewards for something <coughs> bigger, um, and uh, you know, that is part of the holding and waiting system. All right, so moving right along, let me talk about attachment predilections. So. Um, attachment, uh, here there's a nautical theme because in the second book I changed the attachment uh, uh, designations which is, uh, are not really pleasant for a lot of 
uh, folks in, in the lay world. Um, change it to nautical theme. So instead of having uh, avoidant, derogating, dismissive uh, attachment organizations, we're just calling them islands. Um, and instead of being secure autonomous, we're calling those anchors. And instead of being angry resistant, which is not really pleasant um, and hard to say really fast, um, and hard to say if you're doing ishy <laughs> stuff, like, you know, the person is islandish. Well, if they're angry, resistant ish, that's hard. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. So instead of saying ambivalent, anxious, ambivalent, that's Ainsworth stuff, angry, resistant, that's mine and, uh, uh, and Mary Maines. Um, or, uh, uh, you know, just plain difficult. Um, we're calling them waves. Um, now, I just want to say that one of the things I always tell people that everyone is difficult. There is no such thing as a low maintenance person up close. That low maintenance person is going to be high maintenance real soon. Um, <laughs> everybody is annoying. Um, uh, everyone is a pain in the ass. People are a burden. Um, uh, the human primate is warlike, um, selfish, self-centered, moody, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, fickle, uh, xenophobic, um, always aware of what isn't here, uh, what is missing, what I don't have, always uh, comparing and contrasting, um, and uh, uh, you know, just a basically a difficult animal to get along with. And so one of the ways we actually get along is through, uh, through some kind of uh, social contract um, where we make agreements um, uh, that let's not do these things. Um, I want to live so thou shalt not kill. Um, it won't work if I say if I'm in the mood. Um, let's just hold to that and we'll all feel safe. So um, since a couple is the smallest unit of a society, it has to also operate by rules of social justice. That means that partners enter into an agreement that protects, or a series of agreements based on principles, that protect them from each other, from each other, uh, <coughs> and then also from everyone else. So waves are people on the clinging side of attachment, clinging side. These are people who uh, were raised uh, in a manner that made them insecure about their primary objects or primary attachment figures, and usually that figure that is most primary encouraged dependency, encouraged clinging, was alternately, uh, uh, you know, good with proximity seeking and contact maintenance, and then rejecting, uh, unavailable, preoccupied, maybe uh, poorly self-regulated, depressed, um, angry. So this kind of parenting style often gives way to a, uh, a child that is uh, a wave or that is angry resistant. Uh, and, and this is an, a natural outcome of adapting to the environment the child is born into, right? We're just looking at adaption here, not pathology. So this person uh, adapts in a way that makes them um, afraid uh, uh, because of their memory of, of relational trauma, afraid of abandonment, afraid of exquisitely sensitive to any kind of withdrawal. Um, very afraid of rejection, concerned that they are a burden, too needy, um, and negativistic uh, in the sense that if you follow Ronald Fairbairn's work, uh, they have a huge antilibidinal ego that, uh, that predicts failure and thereby makes it happen. Um, they will thwart anything positive uh, in order to push it away to save themselves, spare themselves, the anticipated threat that is their experience. So these folks are negativistic. They pull you toward and then push you away. They become ambivalent, deeply ambivalent at the point of feeling hope. Um, they're allergic to hope. Um, and that makes them difficult to navigate in, in the relational world, especially in the romantic, committed relational world. Mm -hmm. um, these people are more likely to use drugs and alcohol, particularly alcohol, um, as a way of, uh, of helping uh, them calm down um, and in some ways uh, and sometimes uh, be disinhibited or to help themselves with social anxiety. Um, alcohol is often a drug of choice, but so are opiates, uh, benzodiazepines. Um, all of these uh, serve to be a, a self-regulatory function that, uh, that uh, is used in these, uh, as a substitute for interaction with a person, right? So when we think of regulation, um, uh, co-regulation, the, uh, the 
management of states uh, by uh, the, the, a mutual process that is face to face, eye to eye, and skin to skin, that should actually change uh, our state and, and do what medicine or drugs and alcohol would do uh, if that relationship were well attuned um, and fully engaged. Uh, then there would be uh, theoretically less need to go to substances and behaviors to shortcut that system. But since insecures do not trust dependency for good reason based on memory, um, they're more likely to turn to autoregulatory means, in other words, self-soothing, self-stimulating uh, um, without the need of a person. And that uh, often uh, uh, becomes part of the, the problem with addiction is this matter of autoregulation from early childhood. Islands, on the other hand, are insecure but distancing. Their experience is having, to, uh, having had to regulate at least one caregiver's self-esteem. They were rewarded for being independent, basically not being needy and uh, doing things on their own. And so they get it really, uh, real early that uh, in this family there, uh, there is low value for attachment principles. There is low contact maintenance, low amounts of uh, proximity seeking, and there is a definite bias towards uh, performance and appearance. And here we, you know, you might be hearing that on the extreme ends of the clinging group and the distancing group, there is a boundary uh, which is crossed into disorders of the self or personality disorders. So I'm not going to talk about personality disorders today, although they're an important population, as is uh, disorganized folks. Disorganized uh, people um, are divided into several groups, but functionally um, they are uh, unpredictable uh, based on their experience, which is an extraordinary, um, incalculable sometimes experience of of uh, uh, loss and, uh, uh, and trauma that has not been regulated in a timely fashion by an adult. So these unregulated uh, experiences uh, go on to become um, disorganized, uh, disoriented states that are either uh, uh, momentary, uh, you know, because of a trigger, or uh, constant because of a psychotic core due to very early uh, uh, assaults uh, on, uh, on that child's sense of safety. So um, that presents a whole other problem and of course there's a high amount of drug addiction and alcoholism and other uh, risky behaviors by this, uh, in this population of disorganized folks. And then we also have a real uh, problem uh, neurobiologically with people in all of these groups in that the brain is actually different uh, than, uh, than uh, people who are not afflicted by a personality disorder or PTSD or uh, uh, relational stress, relational trauma. To the degree that people have these major assaults early in their life, um, there are massive changes both structurally and functionally in the brain, epi epigenetic changes that, uh, that actually uh, make the trajectory, the developmental trajectory of these individuals impossible to track and impossible to predict. One thing that's very nice about, uh, about insecure attachment is that it's entirely predictable. A good theory not only allows you to figure out, if you knew nothing about the person, figure out based on their current presentation what their childhood probably was like in a general sense, but more importantly, it gives you predictive value of what they're likely to do next and what intervention you can and cannot use in order to help them navigate towards, uh, towards uh, secure attachment. So, uh, but the, s the same can be said about personality disorders, as difficult as they may be to work with. If you understand the, uh, the, the uh, developmental vicissitudes of that disorder, um, they're entirely predictable. Um, now you get into a problem, though, when you have PTSD on top of uh, a personality disorder. Now you have um, a, a deeply uh, uh, malfunctioning brain and we sort of know the areas of the brain that are going to mostly malfunction. But it's definitely going to be uh, a networking issue having to do with reality testing, time and space, this person versus that person, a lot of massive errors in appraisal that are happening all the time, which makes their, their treatment and their lives actually quite difficult. All right, so moving right along. So attachment, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. 
And, and we're trying to get away from this whole thing of blaming the mother. So what, what I'm, I'm going to say is that the mother here is meant to be, a, a meant uh, to be for the primary caregiver. That could be a father. Um, it could be an uncle. It could be a grandfather. It could be uh, a neighbor, um, a nanny. It could be anybody. But, but that mother figure, primary caregiver, generally has the thickest relationship um, in terms of structure, not only attachment structure, but personality structure. And so we often look to that primary uh, system as a, as a, a, a clue to what uh, drives this person in their life, particularly what they're trying to avoid in terms of threat and trauma. So insecure attachment has uh, been uh, um, described as um, insensitive parenting, insensitive parenting. Uh, and, uh, and disorganized uh, is a result of frightening parenting. Okay? But I'm going to add social justice theory to this and say that I think it's more, uh, it's more elaborate and, and more fitting to say that insecure attachment is a culture that is too unfair, too uh, unjust, and too insensitive too much of the time, too much of the time. And this also goes back to uh, social justice theorists, uh, and, but including family uh, systems people like Ivan Bozer and Amy Naj, um, unfortunately not, uh, a, a not a great legacy uh, uh, given that people don't study him, but he studied uh, this idea of justice and fairness within the family system and becoming, of course, if it's unjust, uh, a burden for society uh, later in adulthood. So um, it's also a one-person psychological system. When you deal with insecures, you're dealing with a, uh, because of the fears of dependency, a one-person system where the, the self is more important than the relationship. And this follows basically the culture in which the child adapted to. Um, on the clinging side, it's the foregoing independence, autonomy, separation, individuation for, um, for uh, taking care of a parent, staying close to and emotionally regulating one of the parents. Uh, perhaps they're drug addicted or dissociated <laughs> or, um, or uh, you know, depressed or anxious. Um, but they require the child's attention and the child is discouraged from straying uh, into the non-mother world. So one person psychological system basically meaning that they're selfish and self-centered. Um, the prevailing attitude is it must be good for me and if it's not good for you, sorry. There's no idea of, of collaboration uh, uh, under stress, cooperation under stress, um, a sense of, of, of being principled in the area of fairness and justice and mutual sensitivity that uh, they may uh, strive or say they want that, but they can't actually enact it in, a two in this uh, actual two-person system. And so they, uh, they uh, promote uh, the same th uh, uh, problem that they grew up with a system that is, uh, that is uh, fundamentally unfair and then begins to accrue uh, uh, you know, a, um, a, an ever-growing amount of threat in this. And, and by threat, I'm talking biological threat, uh, which then ends up being um, a big problem in the system. So by definition or by contrast, secure systems are uh, two-person oriented um, uh, in object relations. We're talking about object constancy, whole object relations. Uh, we're talking about people who are differentiated, people who are individuated and fully separated. I'm here I'm crossing different lines of theories to give you different language. Um, <coughs> but these people, you know, uh, uh, also may be deemed as psychoneurotic, uh, certainly not personality disordered. So, um, and they generally start early, um, in, uh, early in childhood as being secure, but they can earn their security throughout their lives because the attachment system is actually quite plastic. Uh, it is greatly influenced by the current relationship that you are in, uh, being that that relationship is interdependent and, that, uh, and that, uh, that relationship represents a primary attachment relationship in adulthood. All right, so the signal response system, very important. You might think of it as the sort of the basic uh, cellular components of attachment. Um, I signal and uh, I signal you know, for your attention, uh, parent, uh, partner, and uh, that may be verbal or nonverbal. Of course, as an infant, it's nonverbal. And uh, then, depending on my brain development, I have a temporal experience of how long it takes for you to respond to my signal. 
right? Um, and then, uh, and then uh, whether your response is appropriate to what I've signaled for, I signal for bologna, you give me salami every time, um, that is misattuned. And, uh, and so that's a disappointment and also uh, feel as a persecuting experience. Um, and then there's the idea of consequence for having signaled in the first place. Um, these are uh, all part of a calculus by which I will signal in the future. So people on the avoidant end, the distancing end, islands, are by definition low signalers. They're also low expression uh, because people in those families tend to not express a great deal with the face or with prosody. Uh, they tend to not make a lot of eye contact. There is less, again, proximity seeking and contact maintenance. And so uh, there is more of a problem um, with uh, physicality uh, which is a, a known necessity for reducing something called allostatic load, the price we pay for adaptation. Uh, we're talking about chronic uh, stress that affects uh, the cardiovascular system, uh, the autoimmune, inflammatory, metabolic systems. Um, these take a toll, wear and tear, in particular on the distancing group. The distancing group tends to have the highest allostatic load of all. Uh, that's because they do not have a lot of high physical contact with others. Uh, they do not share and engage as much as others. Uh, their their uh, tendency uh, in their adaptation is to be secretive, to cordon off aspects of themselves that they keep internal, uh, to vet everything they say uh, uh, because they're afraid of getting themselves into trouble, um, and using all sorts of distancing and disengaging uh, strategies which actually increase their anxiety and their need for substances or behavioral uh, addictions. Um, so this is important, this, and you'll see this operating uh, with adults, how much they signal. Do they signal, do they verbalize uh, their bid for attention, what they want? Do they engage or do they use a, um, a fleeing, um, a, an escaping mechanism as a way to keep themselves safe, which um, uh, this problem with distancing, of course, is a problem with, uh, with uh, prognosis because if you're dealing with a distancing patient, they're not going to tolerate very much intervention. You have to be very careful, otherwise they'll just split, they'll just leave treatment. Um, not so with the clinging type. Um, whether you'd like them to leave therapy or not, they won't. Um, they <laughs> cling. But the prognosis is much better because of their clinging defense, they're able to tolerate more. And, uh, and the, the clinging defense um, uh, tends to speak to a higher level of development. Say what you will about borderlines, um, they tend to, uh, especially mid-level and high-level borderlines, they tend to be um, more object-related than uh, narcissistic disorders, far more. Uh, they tend to be far more related um, and far more flexible in their personality. They have a sense of humor. Um, and they know more about themselves than they let on, which is why supportive confrontation is the tool of choice in working with them and getting them to activate themselves. Whereas the narcissistic personality disorder, part of that distancing group, um, is still not fully consolidated in terms of a self. They're uh, still trying to protect the self from invasion, intrusion, from, uh, from being impinged upon. And so theirs is a much more ex exquisitely sensitive system where they are always on the uh, lookout for attack. Uh, therefore, you have to watch what you do with them because they will leave if they uh, sense that you are a foe, which is quite easy to do. Um, and there you have to use an in interpretation of narcissistic vulnerability, which makes the treatment a little bit longer because of that sensitivity. All right, so signal response system and <coughs> consequences. So I'm, I'm, normally I act this out like a, you know, like a stage show. Uh, I play all these different types, but I think because we have so much information to, to give out, um, I'll just say it uh, from this podium. So on the distancing group, there is a tendency to be addicted to alone time. Right, they're addicted to alone time. And this is not because they're antisocial, this is because they carry uh, by far the most interpersonal stress of all these groups. Um, they actually, if you do a blood and urine exam, uh, exam on them and you're looking for a uh, corticotropin releasing factor or releasing hormone, they uh, produce more of it than anybody else, which is a precursor, of course, to cortisol and adrenaline. So um, they're under the most stress, but they don't know it. Um, they have the most infant dependency needs, but they're in denial of it. And so they're a harder uh, 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 group to get through to because their defenses, dissonant defenses, um, uh, are highly uh, developed. Um, 
they, uh, uh, I, I like to think of, I wrote a paper on this, um, I want you in the house, just not in my room, unless I invite you. That is, in a, in a nutshell, the island, okay? I want you in the house. I can't function if you're out of the house. If you were to leave me, I wouldn't be able to function because my energy is derived from a fantasy that you're always going to be there. And that is a fantasy that we know is present in the practicing period of, uh, of toddlerhood. So there is this fantasy of one-mindedness. We should have the same thoughts, same intentions, uh, and, and the same um, feelings. And when we don't, I feel attacked. So um, the avoidant, uh, like I said, is secretive. Uh, they appear more deceptive. They use a lot more deceptive s uh, markers uh, than anybody else. Um, um, they, uh, in terms of Grice's maxims, they violate principles of quantity and quality. Uh, they mislead. They give you too little information. Yep, nope. They have poor memory because one of their defenses is to forget. Um, they tend to idealize their past uh, and make it whitewashed uh, with little or no detail and no, uh, no autobiographical memory of, of them having been in those memories. <laughs> um, and this is a defense. Or if, it's, if the relationship has been so horrible, then they have bumper sticker statements like, you just pull yourself up with the bootstraps, or you know, um, everyone has a hard life. In other words, they're dismissive in every way. Um, uh, I think of uh, the island as Don Draper. You know, you just move forward. Let's not look back, and, okay, so I murdered somebody, but you just move forward. Um, you know, uh, tomorrow will be another day, uh, Scarlett O'Hare. So, um, so they have uh, an aversion to memory. They have an aversion to the past. They don't are interested in their past. They don't want to go and, and, and dredge up stuff. So uh, therapy is difficult for them. Um, they um, uh, are conflict avoidant. Look up conflict avoidant. It's the island. Uh, they're, uh, by definition, uh, um, passive aggressive. They cannot be aggressive unless they're cornered. So they will be dismissive, devaluing. Uh, they'll avoid, they will comply as a major defense. Um, they will pretend not to hear. Uh, they will do all those things, um, but if cornered, they will attack, okay? So the island is not happy. <laughs> they may seem that way, but it's not a, a, a pleasant place to be uh, because they're always alone. They're internal, they, calcu they calculate everything inside, they don't go out for help, they don't, uh, they don't reveal themselves. Um, and because of their uh, pattern of neglect in childhood, they're auto-regulators, meaning that, they, uh, that more than the average bear, they rely on self-soothing, uh, self-stimulating, no need for you, thank you very much, I can do it myself, okay? They, they like to do everything themselves, and nobody can do it better than them. So it, it sounds terrible, but these are uh, wonderful people who are um, relying uh, on uh, linear thinking of logic and reason, whereas the people in the clinging group, because of their development, tend to be over-reliant on meaning and emotion, meaning and emotion. And you get these two together and you have quite a problem because they see the world through a different lens. They process information quite differently, one inductive, the other deductive. And so, but they're both right, uh, they're just not integrated. So um, people on the wave side um, are over-expressive. They chirp, they talk, they can't stand not talking. They get disorganized or flooded with anxiety if they don't talk. So talking uh, uh, you know, provides a damper for them. And uh, they're given to want to talk at midnight or 10 o'clock at night. Um, if you put them in a, uh, in a silent retreat, they'll fucking kill people um, <laughs> after about 10 minutes because they can't stand it. They have to talk, right? Uh, they'll leave long messages on your phone. Um, they need to be externally regulated. External regulation, like autoregulation, is normal. Uh, it's there from uh, the beginning. Um, you're being externally regulated now in a one direction way. Uh, you're receiving information from me. And that is, in fact, what external regulation is as a strategy. It, is, it lacks simultaneity. It's in one direction only. So when you think of codependence, which is, was term coined in my time, back in the day with Pia <coughs> Melody and, uh, and, uh, and John and so on. Uh, codependency has um, now been distorted in so many ways it should just be thrown out. Um, uh, it refers to the co-alcoholic, but in modern times it's you know, the person who uh, lives for crumbs, uh, who over-focuses uh, on their relationship, doesn't stand up for themselves, uh, and so on. That's the external regulator. The external regulator and the, p and the person who's in the wave area um, uh, tends to over-invest uh, in the other. 
uh, or in the self, but not at the same time. So I want to help you. I want to go out. Let's talk. Let's go out and have a cigarette. You know, I don't smoke. Uh, let's go out and do that. And, and I want to hear all about your problems. I want to hear about you. Um, so I, I, you know, I love that. I love taking care of you, and I love finding out how to be with you. I'm highly engaged. Um, uh, and by the way, I do a lot of proximity seeking and a lot of contact maintenance. I mean, I can do that forever. Uh, uh, but then if I'm in a crisis, then I need you to talk me down off the, the ledge, right? And when I tire you out, I'll call the next person, then the next person, the next person. So that's external regulation. I cannot calm myself down alone. I need another person to do it with me, okay? That's the definition of that. Um, all right, so the overexpressiveness uh, is also uh, misleading. Th these people will kind of go, if you tell them to not talk because their partner's talking, they'll go, ah. Oh, oh, no, not, no, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, oh my God, very dramatic, very dramatic, hyperbolic, always, never. Uh, and that's because uh, they see the world through the, the gist of things, meaning, emotion. Forgive them if they're not precise with their language. They don't care about precision. They care about the, the gist of things, right? Um, all right, so, uh, um, they're allergic to hope, as I said. Uh, the, uh, the wave doesn't want to move forward as opposed to the island. Uh, they won't move forward. They are preoccupied with the past and what just happened, and they can't let go. They're very over-focused on uh, injustices. Um, but their real problem is one of self-activation. They can't grow up, separate, uh, claim what is there, have healthy self-entitlements within a uh, committed relationship. That's their problem uh, uh, developmentally. They cannot self-activate in a relationship by standing their ground and standing up to their partner as an equal partner. Uh, whereas the island can't self-activate in a relationship because he or she is afraid of having their shit taken, their money, uh, their independence, their autonomy, they're always uh, concerned with that. They always have an exit, and they cannot be themselves in the relationship. They can only do that outside of the orbit, which is why they stray a lot uh, and they lie a lot. So both can lie, by the way. But theirs is, a, uh, uh, is, is a, a tendency to flee the situation rather than engage, uh, whereas the, the wave may over-engage and at times also uh, dismiss and push away and devalue. All right. So, uh, um, mismanagement of thirds. In the world of dyads uh, and triads, um, starting from the very beginning, uh, you know, uh, the infant is a single cell organism, unaware of the outside, undifferentiated physically, and then that uh, through sort of a mitotic experience of uh, development, uh, those cells begin to divide and uh, the, the emergence of a real self appears. Uh, the awareness of oneself appears uh, developmentally at different stages. Uh, the awareness of separateness uh, psychologically, uh, the awareness of becoming individuated, all of these, of course, um, have uh, uh, strong consequences of grief and rage and all sorts of other behavioral issues uh, as milestones in getting through these stages of loss. Um, but, uh, but they eventually go uh, from dyads to triads, and this is basically post-edible, right? It's been written about uh, across the board in all developmental theories, uh, a moment of expanding one's worldview, uh, being ripped apart from the primary attachment orbit and forced to include a third, and that usually is another parent or other people, and uh, triads then, uh, then extrapolates out to groups of people. And as we know, or you should know, that uh, people who are, have disorders of the self are still dyadic in nature. They're not triadic, and they, uh, they deal with, uh, with groups of uh, three or more as, uh, as a single entity. All right, so um, uh, a third in a, uh, in a primary attachment relationship, whether uh, you're in the West or you're in some other uh, culture that is polygamous, uh, there's always a primary. That's the person that we run to when we're in the most distress, when we want to celebrate something, when we need advice. There's that primary that we go to. We don't go to everybody um, unless there's been a problem in infancy. So, um, so the, the primacy of that attachment relationship doesn't tolerate thirds intruding and relegating either partner to secondary or tertiary. That causes a problem in the attachment uh, 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 integrity and the safety and security system. So. Um, secure functioning partners 
Secure functioning meaning they are a two-person psychological system uh, engaged in full mutuality, uh, co cooperation, collaboration, good for me, good for you, right? Good for me, good for you. Um, these folks uh, manage thirds effectively uh, without disturbing uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the integrity of the primary <coughs> system and without allowing third things, third people, third tasks to steal resources uh, that are valuable from the dyadic system. That would include children, um, uh, stepchildren, drugs, alcohol, pornography, um, mothers, uh, bosses, work. Um, those are all thirds. Anything outside of the orbit of the dyad is considered a third. Well, addiction is an intrusive third. Um, it's only an intrusive third if the other partner complains about it. So I've had some barfly couples, and they're just fine with their drug addiction and their alcoholism. They're coming in for something else. And so I can't really touch it. I can comment on my fear that they're safe. Um, you know, I can do that. But if it's not a problem uh, between them, then uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something I can't do anything about until I collect enough data uh, to find something that truly does point to the drug use that is causing uh, a breach in the safety and security system. And there always is. There, uh, that always will come about. I just have to wait uh, to prove it. Um, but it is, uh, it is an intrusion or it, it is mismanagement of third if a partner complains about it. And the complaint isn't simply, I come from an alcoholic family, I don't like uh, you doing that, I'm against that, I disapprove. Um, that is important, uh, but more compelling, I don't like the way you become. I don't like that I lose you. I don't like that you become a whole different person. I don't like that you are spending more time doing your thing than being with me. Um, I am jealous of this thing in the, in the appropriate sense. Uh, it's taking from me. And there we have the strongest foothold, uh, the greatest uh, leverage point in dealing with uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, and behavioral addictions in the couple system. Uh, the couple therapist will make a mistake if he or she uh, puts on their drug and alcohol counselor hat and try to intervene on the part of the other partner. Anytime you're doing another partner's bidding, you're fucked. Um, and so you have to play it down the middle. You have to uh, keep your eye on the prize. And in this case, it's secure functioning. Secure functioning is that whatever you guys do, you agree and you can argue as to why this thing is good for me and you. In other words, it has to be uh, argued in a complex manner um, why uh, doing this serves both a personal and a mutual good in a compelling way. Otherwise, it can't work. It's not secure functioning. That's how I stay out of judging whether people want to sleep with goats or not. Um, if they want to and they think it's a good thing and the goat is of age, then, uh, and they can argue why it serves a personal and mutual good, uh, bless them, uh, fine, uh, 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 but let's see what happens. The same with polyamory or anything else that they come up with. So uh, secure functioning uh, and working towards that end um, means that there are certain things we are looking for the couple that we expect and that the couple must be in reality, reality being the safest mother. They cannot bend reality. They cannot hide. They cannot pretend. They cannot deceive. We have tools for that to smoke people out. Um, uh, PACT is a highly, highly strategic approach. Um, and so we, uh, we can corner people, trick people, set them up, um, uh, make it so they can't do anything other than expose themselves without our fingerprints on it. That's the skill. Without, uh, without uh, uh, implicating ourselves, these are strategic uh, ways of dealing with this matter, and that's how we get people to come out of the darkness and to show up uh, because that's the only way we can actually work with people. Uh, basically, the, uh, you know, the, the order here is uh, the triage is emergency issues, of course, come first, um, and then dealing with acting out, which is almost every couple that comes. Uh, you know, teaching therapists to, know, uh, to notice acting out and know that this is not therapy, this is not a therapeutic alliance, this is acting out, uh, yeah. and that you have to use a different tool set in order to work with that and to stop it uh, because um, we have a saying, uh, acting out does not sir deserve therapy. We do not uh, reward uh, acting out with therapy. So it's a whole different way of working to get them on, on board in therapy that could take a while. But then the other problem is getting them to be true, truthful with themselves, with each other, and to say what's true unequivocally uh, without using languaging that is deceptive uh, or incoherent, misleading, 
um, uh, deflecting, contradicting anything that shows that the person uh, is, uh, is using that as a defense to hide something. So um, that's another level of before getting to real work with a couple, and that in itself uh, is a lot of work, right? A lot of work, stopping acting out, getting them on board, and then getting them to show up uh, in a way that is true. Uh, and of course, th we want fully uh, differentiated, individuated uh, people um, who are able to make chess moves with each other based on visibility rather than cloaking themselves uh, and hazing the field. And uh, they're, they're there, and then they're in another place, and then they're in another place. Um, you can't possibly make any moves if you don't know um, where the other person stands. So, um, um, all right, so definitely uh, mismanagement of thirds affects the safety and security system. It will eventually blow up the relationship in any case. Um, it's fair game if and only if the non-addictive partner has a problem with the addictive partner's behavior, and that's what we're always listening for, again, as a wedge issue uh, um, uh, that is down the middle uh, having to do with, I don't care that you're drinking, it, I don't have a problem with it, I can care less. Your partner does, though. And that's what you're going to have to deal with, deal with her, deal with him. Uh, and that allows me to, uh, to stay back as an audience member and not show my cards in terms of preference. Uh, and, uh, and it works out much, much, much better that way. I've never b uh, not been able to get to lies or deception, secrets, uh, addictive problems um, uh, uh, that, didn't, that uh, now do not blow back on me because of the way I play it. Uh, if I were to play it as a drug counselor, I would lose uh, the patient, the patient being the couple, and I don't want to do that. All right, so nervous system regulation. Here we're talking about the preparatory anticipatory systems, which include, but not limited to, uh, uh, the, the neuroendocrine stress system, the HPA, uh, the vagal system in the back, uh, and also uh, the um, uh, prefrontal cortex, particularly the uh, ventral medial area. Um, and so we have people that are basically um, uh, have problems in arousal regulation. Uh, some of those who are disorganized have an, uh, what's called an uncoupled uh, uh, autonomic nervous system uh, that is prone to uh, biphasic uh, a reactivity, uh, a kind of swinging back and forth between hyperarousal and hypoarousal. It's usually when they're in the face of some unresolved trauma memory or loss memory. Uh, but there are people who are airplanes, for lack of a, a better term. Uh, these are people who are biased at the high end of the sympathetic range. These are people who are high stimulation, uh, uh, adventure seeking. Um, uh, they have a lot of vitality affects. They have a high libido that uh, uh, almost runs the gamut of their life. Um, they are given to rage outbursts, uh, which is also up there in the high uh, uh, range of uh, sympathetic arousal. Um, they um, tend to be phobic or afraid of low arousal states such as sadness, depression, shame. Uh, they avoid it at all costs. And they generally come from families who are just like this. If there's no other reason like bipolar illness or drug addiction or some other organi uh, organic issue, um, uh, they've been this way their whole lives. They'll probably be that way their whole lives. Uh, that's who you're working with. These are people who can fight for long, long periods without ever getting tired doubtful that anybody in this room goes long as high arousal couples can. Um, they, uh, they do drugs and alcohol. They're drawn to stimulants, of course, because that allows them to avoid depression. Um, uh, they are, uh, like Melanie Klein's, uh, you know, uh, defense against a, def a depressive position, so they, they choose hypomania. Um, they're, they're an interesting group of people. They're not necessarily high conflict. That's not what defines them. Um, th uh, they're th basically a noradrenergic system that can't help itself, that has to uh, fight and engage uh, you know, with anger uh, and conflict as, uh, as a way of feeling alive. And this is just, again, they're, uh, they're accustomed to it. Um, they're not abusing each other. You don't need to stop them. The only person that may feel abused is you. Um, or your neighbors that are listening to them, they're just fine and dandy. They'll come in and go, hi, nice to meet you, and they'll go, you fucking ass, you and then they'll go at the end, nice to see you again, really great to see you. Uh, very nice people, but they will have their fight come hell or high water, um, and there's nothing you can really do about that, but there are strategies for working with them. Low arousal submarines are people who are biased at the lower end. That doesn't mean they're depressed. 
uh, it means that they don't have high vitality affects. They don't, uh, in their lexicon, uh, isn't um, you know, um, romance, love, excitement, thrill. They're not roller coaster people. Um, think of American Gothic, the painting. That's, that's your low arousal couple. Um, you know, we don't get excited about much here. Uh, you know, no, low expectations are the best. Uh, and, and these people, their idea of love and romance is not like yours. Uh, it's utilitarian and so on. Um, these, these people, uh, the low arousal in the, in the quadrant of low arousal and avoidant are the highest, uh, the most anxious group of all. This is where you'll find lots of GAD, OCD, simple phobias, agoraphobia, and so on. Um, very, very anxious group. Uh, and uh, when you see them, you'll know why. Uh, they don't move a lot, they don't express a lot, they don't get angry, um, and they're very internal and avoidant, and they, they're low contact, so they, they have no way of, of calming uh, that uh, HPA system down and turning it off. And then biphasic, you have somebody who's high arousal and somebody who's low arousal. Um, uh, one's rock and roll, the other one's country or classical. They get along uh, great during uh, courtship because they have time to even each other out, balance each other out. But then they get married and they don't have that time and they smack into each other and this becomes uh, a problem of uh, reunion. They have a reunion issue. They're too far away from each other uh, in ter terms of their uh, arousal set points. Again, this seems to be environmental. Uh, I've seen attachment change. I have yet to see arousal bias change throughout the lifespan. It seems to be pretty steady. All right, uh, do you really need McLean's triumph brain? Okay, let's do it. All right, so uh, uh, McLean and uh, his triumph brain, it's quite simple, uh, a little overly simple, but it's good for our purpose. Um, in PACT, we're dealing, we're working with uh, implicit systems, uh, procedural memory. Um, those are known, those subcortical uh, processes are, uh, are fairly uh, non-plastic, hard to change, uh, resilient, and under stress, they're the only ones uh, online uh, because higher cortical areas require much more oxygen and glucose to run, and so uh, uh, it's always going to go to the primitives, uh, uh, lower uh, subcortical regions uh, uh, to uh, save the day and to get you through a dangerous situation, uh, but also uh, wreaks havoc in love relationships because we tend to shoot first and ask questions later with this area of the brain. Um, we are targeting in PACT the, uh, the lower areas uh, um, uh, brainstem and also lower limbic circuit. Uh, that's where we're going for, and so we use a lot of staging techniques, psychodramatic techniques, surprise, crazy stuff, weird, offbeat, silly, unexpected uh, things uh, to, uh, to get at uh, 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 these repetitive somatic reactions that we can actually rely on because we know that narratives fail, narratives lie, we can't really rely on narratives hardly ever. Uh, that gets to another issue here. Um, real time is too fast. Uh, and because real time is too fast, we mostly don't know what we are doing at any given moment and why. That is just a fact. Uh, about 90% of our day is fully automatic, run by procedural memory, recognition. Uh, these are uh, uh, low resource areas that uh, allow you to do your day without much stress. Uh, you're able to drive your car, paint your nails, talk on the phone, do all those things. Of course, when you first learn it, you can't. Uh, more of the brain is online. Novelty will do that, uh, which is why the beginning of a relationship um, <laughs> is like a drug addiction. You are on drugs. Uh, you meet that new person. They're novel. Uh, the brain loves novelty. Uh, everything is engaged. Uh, 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 you are attentive, you are present, you want to know everything about this person, you want to taste them, you want to touch them, you want to smell them, you want to do everything, and then you automate them, and they automate you, like you're going to do everything, right? And now, uh, now you, you're, you're done with that, and you think you know them, and this is where the problem begins. Because we're memory animals, most everything we do is by memory, the primary attachment system uh, has a very, very long memory, um, because partners are proxies for everybody who came before. Um, it is most like the earliest uh, relationship, um, uh, earliest relationship between caregiver and child. And so that is what's going to come to play as we automate ourselves. Not only are we going to take the other person for granted and no longer pay attention, which has an impact on the experience of exciting love uh, and boredom, but also we're going to make a ton of errors based on misattributions, based on recognition of threat cues that may or may not actually be in existence, and then we, uh, we trigger each other and now we're off to the races. Very easy to go to war 
um, very easy to go to war, even with our loved ones. Um, uh, our ability to perceive threat, and, and I mean small t threat, is acute. Uh, it's well known. Uh, it's a daily uh, problem. Uh, that tilt of your head means something, the way you just said that. You're putting up your hand uh, is dismissive. Uh, you look down, I know what that means, and, uh, and that causes all sorts of problems. And because people pair bond by recognition only, familiarity only, we don't pair bond with strangers, uh, the chances that people are more alike than not are high, are high, very high, which is why we have a saying in this work, there are no angels and are there are no devils. No angels, no devils. And where there's one, there's always the other. Where there's one, always the other. It looks like uh, they're not, it looks like they're innocent. They're not, they're complicit. That's the system. Uh, and a couple therapists, like walking across the street, you look both, both ways or you go splat, Couple therapists should look both ways or they will go splat. Um, lots of mistakes in, in this work uh, that are uh, actually uh, huge uh, potential for mistakes. So when we're dealing with ambassadors and primitives, even more simple than uh, McLean's model, we're dealing with, uh, with areas, uh, high cortical areas that are expensive, error correcting, regulatory, but also fallible uh, to, low re uh, to being low resourced, uh, they're slow, um, and they're also given to error as well. This is, uh, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, fast, uh, fast brain, uh, thinking fast, thinking slow, right? Uh, fast brain, slow brain. That's the sl slow brain. But it is relational. Um, it is uh, contingent, right? It's conscious. It's able to make relativistic uh, choices, um, generally speaking. Whereas the primitives are cheap to run, fast, lightning fast, automatic, um, and not very plastic. But when you consider um, all the cognitive behavioral therapy you've had or analysis, all the smarts that you have, wow, you're really good. You know everything. You've been through a lot of analysis, and you get in front of your 16-year-old, and you're now a 5-year-old. <laughs> a lot of good that did. Because, uh, because we're reduced to being animal, uh, automatic, primitive, when we're under a certain amount of stress. That's what's going to happen. When we go live, that's the problem, which is why in couple therapy, uh, in PACT, we do long sessions and we put people uh, under a lot of stress, alternately relaxing, stress them, um, because it's under the stress that we're able to see what's actually going on. Uh, under the stress, people leak. People show um, who they are and what they're up to and what they really want, and that's what we're after. And we do that by putting pressure on people, putting them under stress, um, and watch how they uh, operate and interact. By the way, um, we do a lot of clinical research uh, using uh, microanalysis of uh, digital video. So, uh, you know, years and years of, of videotaping couples, watching their micro expressions, micro movements, uh, use of vocal changes, um, uh, studying that frame by frame in slow motion, uh, reverse and double speed, uh, really gives us a lot of insight into the human animal uh, and in that environment uh, uh, of the love relationship. So, uh, this is what we study. Uh, window of tolerance you may already have known about. Dan Siegel came up with it in 2000. We've all co-opted it. Um, nice uh, schematic idea of what would be the ideal s uh, state of mind given uh, enough, uh, enough relaxation and enough alertness <laughs> to be able to use all of your brain, have all ores in the water. So this, of course, is highly subjective. Your window of tolerance or optimal range um, uh, depends on your own development, your own ability to hold and wait, your own ability to regulate yourself, but also things like how much sleep you've had, whether you're eating properly, getting enough exercise, whether you're in physical pain, uh, all of those will affect window of tolerance. Now, with patients, it doesn't matter because we're going to dysregulate our couples anyway. That's, uh, uh, that's how we actually work with them. We have to dysregulate them in order to work with the, uh, that memory system, which is driven by state. State drives memory, memory drives state, and state alters perception. That's the system we're dealing with. In order to get to the real problem, we have to make them go live, and so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna tip them over in some yeah. manner uh, to, uh, to get that going so we can work with that. However, the therapist should not go out of window of tolerance. Um, if you go out of window of tolerance, if you become hyper aroused, uh, you engage a hypothalamic system of fight or flight and you're going to act out countertransference. That's the problem. You start to uh, move too fast, you're not aware of your own blood pressure, muscle tension, your heart rate, and now you're going to do something stupid. And it seemed like a really good idea and as it dawns on you, you go, oh shit, that was not good. 
That's because you did what everyone does, you operate uh, automatically impulsively uh, from that hypothalamic system. Uh, just the same, if you drop and get too uh, low, you lose your alertness and you start dreaming with your patient. Uh, you start you know, saying things that don't make any sense uh, and you lose consciousness. Um, and so that's why we look at this as, uh, for the clinician. The clinician has to have a way of staying in that sweet spot. And one of the things that we do is in PACT is that we use uh, chairs on wheels. We don't uh, have them here to demonstrate, but everyone's on wheels. Everyone's on chairs that adjust. And we do that, uh, first of all, so we can watch the fine muscle movements and somatic reactions of our patients. They're able to move and adjust themselves vis-a-vis -vis each other and me, the therapist. And uh, I'm able to manipulate their positions for, uh, for uh, effect. Uh, but I'm also able to regulate myself by where I roll. I'm able to regulate them by how I roll, how I tilt my head, how I move up or down in the chair. Um, I'm able to move back far to get sort of a, a, a wide angle lens of them, which changes my state and my perspective if I need to, so I can be an audience uh, to the couple and not be uh, you know, uh, embedded in the system. Uh, or I can move very close to anchor something uh, or to downregulate a partner. So this movability, most everybody that I worked with and, uh, and, and that is a student of mine uh, will attest to this, that once you go on wheels, you never go back. <laughs> and then you'll wonder why we ever came up with static furniture in the first place when it comes to therapy. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. People are stuck and you can't see what they're doing. You can't see their contradictions uh, somatically. And again, we're always looking at what people are doing um, uh, in terms of their pupil size, breathing, skin color, skin tautness in the striated muscles in the face and the arms and the legs, movements, not movements, uh, vocal tone, uh, vocal pressure. All of these things we're monitoring all the time because affect is, uh, is uh, uh, you can be fooled by affect. Um, you can't be fooled by arousal, right? So we're tracking arousal, which gives us a sense also of affect. That's where we're looking and people can't hide that. They can't hide. Um, we can always do something that, uh, that is evocative, provocative, and then we watch and see what their bodies do. Therein lies the truth. Therein lies where people really are because people lie. People not only lie, but because I said real time is too fast and we don't know what we're doing half the time, when asked, we make shit up. We confabulate. Most of the time, we're making shit up. Most of the time, we are filling in blanks. That's what the brain does. It fills in blanks. Uh, it needs organization. If you ask me a question, I'm going to come up with a reason. Of course, I just read it in Reader's Digest. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but it sounds good and gets you off my back. So uh, we have to understand that this is, this is the way we roll. This is how we are. Um, and so we, uh, because people don't know what they're doing, don't know what they're talking about most of the time, and they lie, we can't rely on narratives at all, okay? We can, we can compare narrative to somatic reaction and see how congruent people are. But we're gonna catch people in the spaces. We're gonna catch people in between words and movements. We're watching what they do in the space. They give away everything in the space, okay? And I'll show you that in a bit. All right, so regulation strategies. Everybody okay so far? Am I losing anybody? Is this too fast, too much? Okay, I took speed this morning, so. <laughs> All right, so. So, uh, so auto-regulation, normal, everyone does it. You did it when you, know, when you were playing with your body, playing with yourself, proprioception, early in childhood. Um, you know, auto-regulation, uh, self-stimulation, self-soothing, I don't need you. Um, and we do it when we read a book, when we see a movie, when we watch television, when we uh, masturbate, <laughs> when we, uh, uh, you know, some people auto-regulate during sex. Uh, sex addicts always do. Um, uh, and so I I it's, it's normal. However, as I said, a certain group of people, particularly those who've been neglected, overuse it, and for good reason. There's a reason why they had to rely on it, because there was nobody to interact with. So, uh, and we're not talking about material neglect, we're talking about functional neglect here, in terms on, a, on an attachment level. So um, these people ought to regulate, and, uh, and in some senses, uh, 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 th they're guilty of self-object uh, relating in a cohesion sense, because they may actually be delayed uh, developmentally, uh, and they're, uh, they're not personality disorders, but they have a holdover from it, uh, whereby they still uh, uh, operate under uh, one-mindedness, uh, and uh, also that means fusion, and also uh, this idea of, um, 
of, of taking care of the self as opposed to going to another person. Okay, so it becomes problematic. It's automatic. It's they're not. It's not done purposely. It's a it's a default situation. Uh, you put me uh, interaction, and I'll interact with you. You go to the bathroom, and I get on my phone. And now when you come back, I'm resistant about interacting with you again. So autoregulators, avoidance islands have a hard time shifting from interacting. Um, uh, shifting from being alone and focused to interacting. They have a hard time shifting. They can't. They shift very easily from interacting to being alone, without any problem, any distress. Waves, on the other hand, the clinging group, they have the opposite problem. They have a hard time acclimating to uh, from interacting to being alone. They eventually acclimate, but they have pain. Um, there is a problem is uh, is an exquisite sensitivity to separations and reunions, uh, and so uh, they have a hard time shifting in that other direction. They shift very easily from being alone to interacting. Um, okay, so uh, external regulation, uh, pro it's, it can be pro-self and pro-relational. Um, it's pro-self when it, is, uh, when it uh, is, uh, becomes uh, wholly, uh, not, um, you know, lacks simultaneity and it's just do me, do me, right? Or I'm doing you, which has a, a, a pro-self uh, function as well. Um, uh, okay, and the, the people who are in the wave area, the clinging group, which includes borderlines, I, I want to just let you know that when I say distancing group and, and, uh, and clinging group, I'm describing uh, a variety of ways of looking at personality and, uh, and organization um, uh, from a variety of different uh, theories, so you can identify with that idea. Um, uh, they tend to rely, overly rely on external regulation uh, uh, which uh, makes th their ability to interactively regulate more uh, uh, difficult. All right, um, interactive regulation, also normal, is there, um, bless you, almost uh, soon after birth. Um, th uh, the baby leads in the first year is basically the conventional wisdom, uh, and the mother follows. That's the way it goes. In order to find the baby, you have to uh, locate the baby. You have to be willing to uh, be observant, wait, let the baby lead, and this is how you find the baby, through reflective function, Vonnegut's term, and through presence and attention. But also, um, once the baby uh, starts something and, and the parent is engaged, the outsider cannot tell the difference uh, in terms of who's leading, who's following. So they are interactively regulated. They are interactively regulating. And Melanie Klein recognized this. Everybody has recognized this. Eric Erickson saw this, and so on. Winnicott saw this. So that's an interactive regulatory function, and it's done face to face, eye to eye, in, in infancy, uh, skin to skin, but in adulthood, eye to eye, and it's straight on, direct, uh, uh, because we're legally blind on this side, uh, because of limitations of the eye. Uh, we have to. Uh, when regulating each other, we have to be directly in front of each other, facing each other, or we actually become more threatened. Uh, the uh, threat systems are activated more often when we see a face at a, a glance or when it's to our side. So um, certainly a problem when we're on the phone because we're just relying on prosody, uh, or even worse, when we're texting uh, and emailing, people get into fights over that because they can't, uh, we're visual animals in order to uh, in order to reduce the error rate of verbal miscommunication, we need to s we need our eyes on the person's mouth and eye, left eye, uh, and so uh, uh, anything other than the visual contact, uh, we are given to more errors, um, uh, errors in appraisal, um, and then as our stress goes up, uh, our uh, our number of errors increase, increase. Um, all right. And then self-regulation is the only one that's not there during birth. Um, it is, uh, it is uh, comes online around 10, 11, 12 months uh, in a nascent uh, uh, version of itself. Um, and uh, that is the beginning of inhibition and, uh, and uh, restriction. That's holding and waiting. That's the beginning of being a human being that's able to uh, um, uh, resist a, a impulse. It's the beginning also of empathy uh, and because it's engaging the right over the frontal area and uh, beginning to uh, also, uh, uh, you know, areas of the ventral medial uh, prefrontal cortex are being innervated. And so uh, the baby is having that function of down regulation, but also uh, in the back of the brain, in the 10th cranial nerd, uh, nerve, uh, the uh, ventral, uh, I'm sorry, the dorsal motor uh, ventral vagal system, the unmyelinated uh, uh, vagal branch, uh, is also there to uh, provide a certain uh, modicum of vagal break, breaking and um, vagal tone. 
All right. So uh, this is when, you know, uh, about four years old, we start giving the marshmallow test, a test to see how kids are engaging that prefrontal cortex in holding and waiting, and that's turned out to be highly predictive of later function. All right, so um, here's uh, an example of two people. One is an external regulator. The other one is, uh, is an autoregulator. Uh, in other words, one is a definite wave, and the other one's a definite island. What could possibly go wrong? And um, so I'm going to show you just a real quick piece uh, of what happens um, when uh, they're misinterpreting each other uh, based on their arousal strategies while under stress, and then a correction. Uh, their faces are, are not seen, not because I'm hiding them, but because I forgot to move the camera up. <laughs> and so here we go. Start doing it. I, I need your help. Just do it. Just go go for it. What do you do? I've worked all day. I've got so much to do. Can't yeah, you help so. me? Please. you got to help me. showing fear on his face, by the way. Can't you just stop playing the computer? And your body. He'll his body. Can't, can't you help please it. stop playing the computer help, and help me? Bring back. Bring back. <laughs> yeah. And that's okay. an arousal keep, spike. Keep doing that. Take your hands out of your pocket. Um, I'm just going to help you with this. All right. Okay. Um, keep doing that. I mean, I have to rush around all day. And instead, move forward. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Move forward. <laughs> and move I have dishes to wash and a laundry to do. And, um, hi. <laughs> <laughs> So notice they'll look at each other. That's one of the signs that the intervention was effective. I know, I know, I know. All right, and so um, and so uh, uh, we we move him forward because uh, his memory, the memory that he has of his mother attacking him, uh, uh, everything about moving forward is dangerous. It's the last thing he would do, which is why I'm making him do it. Um, with a wave, uh, somebody who's in the clinging group, um, they respond best to moving forward. Uh, not so with the island. They respond best to moving forward despite their negativism. That's what, uh, that's what quells the anticipatory threat of being punished and rejected. Uh, and so the proper move is forward. And as you can tell, uh, this is not practice. As you can tell, as soon as he does that, she stops. She goes, uh, hi. And she is fine immediately. And I mean immediately, OK? With physical contact, this group uh, is, uh, it, uh, uh, is best served with physical contact. They respond to physical contact, and some uh, with words of love uh, and affection, okay? So because they're very word-based, language-based, and physical in terms of physical comfort, um, they like that, and that is the best way to calm yourself down is to know who you're with, the animal you're with. That person works best if you move forward. They calm down, you calm down. That's the way interactive regulation works. So, uh, but he would never have done it um, uh, uh, because uh, why would he do it? Uh, we have to go with her strategy because, um, by, uh, again, developmentally, she's more advanced than he. She has more development than he, um, despite her ambivalence, despite her uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, um, seeking uh, a proximity to a point where it might be difficult for someone. Um, she, we, that's the direction we want to go in. We don't want to go in the direction of distancing and avoidance uh, because that has a dead end to it. So, okay, so you get an idea of some of the things we do that are corrective, uh, that are physical, not talking, uh, and then we repeat this uh, to get it into the body, and that changes things tonight. All right, so um, arousal tells, we're tracking arousal. Uh, we train to, uh, to uh, look for and to study micro-expressions, micro-movements. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, very good at that. And once you get good at this, you, s you start to see things you never saw before, maybe things you wish you didn't see. Um, and the skill set is, is not, um, is, uh, just increases your ability to, to be social. It increases your ability to get along with others. It increases your empathy. And I'll say something. Um, the clinician use of outside meditation, which is what we do, uh, we pay ongoing, continuous attention to every detail in the body, every mole, every uh, place where there was a, a, a piercing, um, every scratch, uh, breast implants, hair plugs, uh, Restylane, uh, anything and everything tells us about the person we're with. And so we're, we're trained, uh, we train ourselves and we're trained to notice everything. 
Um, and that also uh, allows us to track somatic reactions in the body, what people do, don't do. And again, we know where to look for if the heart rate, we're able to test uh, you know, dryness or wetness quite easily uh, with somebody who's under stress. And we're able to look for signs of hyperarousal, hyperarousal, including collapse. So we're really adept at that, which also gives us a doorway into tracking deception or possible deception. We never assume to know the source or the target of that deception. We just know it is. We just know that somebody's hiding something. Somebody's using resources, unnecessary resources, to think. And, uh, and, uh, and a lot of that is ill-timed, a uh, time when somebody shouldn't be thinking. They should be uh, answering uh, quickly because it's a recognition question. But no, they, they treat it as something they have to think through. And there's a reason for that, and we always explore it. All right, so breathing cues, eye cues, gesture cues, uh, speech parent, we even track it if we can, depending on the lighting, uh, pupil uh, changes in pupil size. Um, makes the work a lot of fun, I'll tell you. It really makes, it's never a dull moment. Um, arousal regulation, um, in the system where we're on chairs with wheels, um, I always make sure that, uh, that uh, my relationship with each partner remains in window of tolerance, that I'm quick to repair any injury, misstep, um, and that I keep that relationship safe and secure at all costs. However, the couple relationship, I will gladly dysregulate. I'll just, I'll just tip them over um, because that's part of the work. So I'm very protective of the individual relationships I have with each partner, uh, but, um, but I'm not careful at all with the couple. Um, they're in each other's care and not mine. So let me explain how this whole thing started. This started uh, because of my fascination, not only with my own divorce at the time, because I was deeply depressed and troubled, um, but at the time I was studying infant brain development and I was working uh, with infant mother pairs uh, in the hopes that I could prevent future problems uh, with the infant. Uh, and uh, by that time I was already using video. Um, but it occurred to me that couple therapy is imagined wrongly uh, in that uh, the emphasis be on self-regulation and we still have some models that emphasize it. I think it's uh, wrongly uh, uh, conceived because of the way we're wired, because of how we are built. Uh, we're built for interactive regulation. Um, we're built at close distances. I can see what's going on in you before you know it. You can see what's going on in me before I know it. Why would nature do that? Because I need another person uh, for knowledge of myself, knowledge of the other, uh, to be able to uh, help rein in certain things or to help kickstart certain things, to help me do things I cannot do. But wait, I picked you and the same thing. There are things you cannot do and that's my role is helping you. So we, uh, the, the imagination, the image is always this. They're in each other's care, not their care, in each other's care. And that turns out to be much more efficient um, uh, in terms of regulation and problem solving. And it solves the problem of people who are not necessarily good self-regulators. Not, not, uh, not all couples are equal. There are uh, partners who are uh, we call master regulators. They are uh, doing the bulk of the regulation in the couple. That's not a problem. Uh, but it does show itself when that master regulator gets, <coughs> gets a cold or the flu. Um, then the system uh, you know, becomes uh, destabilized. When the non-master regulator gets sick, nothing happens. And that's how you can tell, okay, nothing happens. All right, so interactive regulation. Do people need a break? Yes. Let's take a break and come back. Are you enjoying this? Yes. Oh, goody. All right, uh, and then, and then we'll, we'll get to the meat of this, which is ba uh, which Back is in 10 minutes. Back in 10. All right, so you, what you wanna do is, uh, you wanna make sure that you get partners face to face. Um, and, and again, if you have static furniture, that's gonna be hard, because if they're on a couch, they're, uh, they're aimed at you. And to get them to look at each other and stay with each other, they've gotta crane their neck, and that's uh, uh, difficult. So get yourself some wheels, um, get yourself some uh, uh, office chairs, there's some really nice ones, uh, uh, you know, uh, great ones actually. Uh, they can range from very cheap staples to very expensive ones. Um, and uh, I promise you if, you, if you have the space to do it, um, you'll never want to go back. Um, you'll, again, wonder why you ever did uh, anything other than that. So you want to get them face to face, eye to eye, so that uh, they're on stage, you're off stage. Um, we have a packed serenity prayer. Let me just give it to you, you're all clinicians. So this is the packed serenity prayer. This is for uh, therapist self-regulation and to make sure that the uh, therapist stays on frame. Um, it goes like this. I am a couple therapist. These people picked each other. They are in each other's care. 
Therefore, they're not my problem. <laughs> my only job is to get them to be secure functioning in this life or the next. Let's repeat. I'm a couple therapists, not an individual therapist, not a baker or a candlestick maker. I stick to that one thing. Uh, they picked each other. I may not have picked you. No, I don't like you. But you picked each other. Yay. You're in each other's care. Thankfully, I don't go home with you. That's great. Um, therefore, you're not my problem. It's very different than working in any other modality. Um, what you do uh, or you don't do isn't my problem. My only job is to push you, shove you, control you uh, uh, to do secure functioning because it's the only uh, way that people can interact over the long run without accruing threat uh, and animosity. Um, and, uh, uh, and so uh, it, whether you do that now or in your next relationship is fine. That's my goal. That's my only goal. All right, and it really helps, and still to this day, it helps me calm down when I see a couple in front of me I'm going to be with for several days and several hours a day. And uh, they look, uh, you know, like they're very difficult to me. And I go, oh, my God, I didn't vet this properly. I am a couple therapist. These people picked each other. Right? Uh, it really does uh, sort of put a comb through your hair <coughs> if you have hair. Um, we're teaching them to read each other's faces. Um, we're good at reading faces. We want to see how well they do it. Um, because PACT is a, um, is a uh, it used to be called a deficit model that's consistent uh, with neuroscience. Uh, but because it sounds so negative, we call it now a capacity model. Same thing, uh, it just sounds better. Uh, capacity model, it's a developmental model um, that is looking at the developing brain from infancy, infant attachment, uh, um, and the, the, uh, the, the amount of, uh, of uh, symmetry networking uh, vertically and horizontally in the brain. Um, how acute are, uh, is the, their social emotional capacities to read faces, interoceptive cues, uh, to be able to name affects, uh, and so on. So we're also uh, aware of deficits, people, uh, things that people cannot do. Now there are deficits that are hardware related, uh, there, uh, and those you cannot change. Uh, there are deficits that are both hardware and software, and uh, uh, a lot of those are personality disorders and people with, uh, with uh, severe PTSD and so on. Uh, but uh, again, we understand the deficit and we understand what's a defense and what is something that uh, a person cannot do regardless of defense. Um, uh, it is a gaping hole, right? Uh, and we find these, uh, these uh, uh, deficits in the area of memory, uh, visual uh, uh, detail, um, uh, affect uh, blindness, uh, alexithymia, uh, and of course, uh, a big one, uh, is theory of mind issues, uh, and those are impossible to treat. Um, so we want, uh, we're want we sweeping for deficits and, and uh, trying to understand uh, what they are by having them face to face, uh, seeing if they can read each other's faces accurately. Uh, oh, she looks angry. Well, where do you see it? Uh, her earlobes. Well, uh, we have no data to show that anger looks uh, affects the earlobes. Um, <laughs> vocal cues, tells, and so on. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate a little bit of this. Um, can I have, uh, I probably have the lights on. Uh, oh, up here, are there lights up here or is this? Ah, yeah, there we are. Uh, and I'm going to take this portable mic and could I just have two, uh, two volunteers? Uh, don't worry, I won't uh, put you in a terrible position. Um, I won't <laughs> embarrass you. Um, uh, to come up as volunteers, just two. Uh, and so, and come a little closer together because uh, I'm going beyond the initial interview, which is, um, which involves many times they're in a V position. So they don't start in this way. Disorganized sometimes will start in this way and they have their reasons. Um, but generally speaking, they, they, they uh, pose uh, in a V configuration, sometimes in a theater seating, like a, a do us kind of uh, seating, uh, where they're just looking right at me uh, side by side. Um, but uh, they're going to end up here at some point in the first session. So this is a little bit like doing this interview, which is a forensic interview, forensic type. Uh, in other words, um, I am going to be asking them questions and monitoring their, uh, their body reactions and their reactions to each other um, uh, as a way of getting information beyond the actual question uh, that I'm asking. And I'm constantly flagging uh, issues that are coming through somatic reactions that I want to follow up on. So uh, in the first session, we get, uh, we get a, uh, a sketch, right? Uh, we're getting an overview, a coverage, uh, in order to flag areas that we want to uh, follow up on, go deeper with. 
Um, we have to do that, otherwise we'll go down the rabbit hole. Um, and so I'm doing that initial interview, getting a genogram, getting the basic structure of their families of origin, uh, and then also asking basic questions. Uh, and I may ask, uh, you know, I'll be sitting uh, far back, and I'll say, uh, so do you guys have sex? And my eyes are going back and forth, and I'm checking their timing. I'm checking uh, how they look at each other, uh, what they're not doing. Uh, one person goes, uh huh, and the other person goes, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm, that's flagged, right, that's flagged. Um, I ask somebody, so, um, so what do you do for a living? And, and he says it, um, I don't like my job, he says. What do you really want to do? And he says, I want to be a minister. That gets flagged, okay? Because when somebody feels proud about something, uh, excited about something, they don't look down like that. So there's, that's flag worthy. And I'm picking up all these uh, clues that there's, su there's a there there, right? I'm listening to their voice, how they answer, all of that. Um, and they don't know that, but that's fine. Um, and I'm doing something else. Um, I'm doing something called cross, uh, crossing, cross questioning, cross commenting, cross interpreting, and cross tracking. Let me start with cross tracking. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, but as you answer it, I'm going to look at you, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to go back and forth, up and down, because I'm, I'm tracking every move that they make or don't make. Uh, and then as soon as uh, she starts talking, I look over here. Now, this is counterintuitive. It's very hard to learn. It, seems, it sounds like it would be easy, but it's not, uh, because you have, to, you have to defy a natural wiring for us to look at the person who's talking. Right? And of course, in, in, in social discourse, it would be rude to constantly do that. Um, but in here, uh, I'm crossing tracking because the person who is talking is using a lot of resources in the high left. And those resources are dampening down their facial expressions, um, and they're not as interesting. So I'm going to look at the person who is uh, not using those resources for cues and clues of how they feel about the truth or the accuracy or what the other person is saying or doing, and that's going to lead to uh, other pieces of work. That's why I'm looking constantly and crossing it, crossing it, right? Uh, but I'm also going to ask cross questions, uh, and this allows me to get more information than I would if I went direct, but also it's an arousal trick, and I'll explain why. So, um, so um, what would she say about why, uh, why you're here uh, today and, and coming to couple therapy? And then I'm looking here. So notice I'm asking a question, what would she say? I'm trying to get her read on what she would say. Um, and this is a, a, a technique that comes from the, the, the um, uh, Milan group, uh, circular questioning, of getting information. And uh, it's an arousal trick because the person who's the target uh, is going to say neutral in terms of their arousal because my eyes aren't on them, right? When my eyes are on, that's exciting. That's going to uh, cause a sympathetic spike. And, uh, and maybe a deer in the headlights look, and the information I get isn't going to be as, uh, as clear as I need it to be. So I'm gonna ask this person about this person. This person uh, remains uh, okay, uh, because uh, they're not being, they don't know they're the target. This person uh, um, is uh, being tested for their knowledge, right? Because they're in each other's care. You're supposed to be an expert. Uh, you're supposed to know, right? So that's good. And then this person gets to be a fly on the wall and hear what their partner knows. Uh, so, uh, so it's far more bang for your buck to cross things. And as you'll see, it also keeps you out of trouble if you, uh, if you uh, run into a defense here or there. Um, it's, you're not going to get pushed back because uh, you're crossing the question. I can, I can say to her, is, is, she always, uh, is she always this irritable? And before she knows what hit her, I'm back in her face regulating her. I got away with something. So I'm able to get more information, push more information out. I'm able to move the ball forward faster <coughs> by crossing uh, the questions without getting defense, without getting anything back. And of course, I'm always there to repair anything uh, in case I misstep, which I'm going to because part of this work is the therapist is going to be the, uh, the bull in the china shop, uh, the clown at the bullfight. Um, we have to expand the psychological uh, um, space uh, otherwise, they won't fill it in. So I will use hyperbole. Uh, it sounds like you just want to str strangle the shit out of her. 
Okay, I just, I just aimed way over the top, and that allows her to pull it back into reality. If I don't aim over, then I, then I have to expect her to push it out, which she's not going to do. So now she's in, no, I don't, no, I don't, no, no, I don't feel that way. Oh, okay, I, what do I know? Um, I just feel, yeah, I do want to strangle her. Okay. So uh, oftentimes you're right on. Um, all right, so I'm cross-questioning uh, uh, to get information, and when if I go direct, I have a reason of going direct and why I don't cross it. But I'm also going to cross-comment. Uh, you know, she didn't like that, but you just did. Now, I'm only going to do that a little bit because I'm pointing her in the direction of you're not noticing, you're not watching. I don't want to be the only audience to you guys' reactions. You guys have to do this yourselves. So only uh, so much of cross-commenting, but where it gets very powerful is to interpret. So I get to interpret um, her to you. I get to interpret you to her. Let me tell you about Sally. What is your name, by the way? Kim. What's your name? Ofra. Ofra. Okay, I'll remember Ofra. Ofra. Kim. Um, and so let me tell you about Ofra. Um, and now if Ofra is, uh, is, is, is somebody who's in the distancing area, and which means I'm, I'm not going to get a therapeutic alliance unless I'm clever, uh, because this person has no interest in me or therapy at all, um, I'm going to wait for an opportunity to rescue this partner from this partner as my way in. Uh, and so she's going to uh, be angry with her, probably for distancing and doing the other stuff that avoidance do. And then I can roll in and go, um, you know, uh, hold on a second. Uh, hold on. Um, uh, let me explain, I think, what's happening here, if I may, if you don't mind. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think, as though you mean very well, I, I, I don't think you realize this, maybe you do, that your partner has a, a real exquisite sensitivity to feeling exposed in front of me, in front of anybody, uh, uh, and that it, it feels like an attack. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, that may be something that you're not aware of that comes from a real experience of, of, of being around people who are judgy and, and critical and performance-minded and so on. And, and you're going to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm taking her nods as a go-ahead. I'm floating theory here. I'm guessing. I'm using theory, uh, which is uh, pretty cool, uh, to guess her. And since islands are, be are terrible spokespeople for themselves, they're good at talking about their work, but they're terrible about talking about themselves because they don't know anything, um, I'm giving voice, I'm scaffolding uh, the self. Uh, I'm protecting her from her partner, uh, which makes me useful at this moment. But I'm using this as a trick to get away with something. I'm now getting all this information out about her without her uh, saying I can, except under the guise of rescuing her. Um, uh, my guess is, do, do you know who it was uh, that was uh, that was very critical of her? Do you know, by, by any chance? Do you know uh, who, who was really critical of her, uh, embarrassed her, shamed her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you do. Who, who was it? Okay. I think it was, I'm going to have to say something about. You think or you know? How long have you guys been together? <laughs> Over 11 years. And you think you know? How come you don't know? Okay, so you, Well, that doesn't mean that you don't observe her. She may be a closed book. You guys are supposed to find the baby in each other. You're supposed to be observing each other. Okay, um, so Father, is that, is, that, is that true at all? Oh, I'm sorry. What, what did he do? Make it up? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm already in. All right, I can do more to get in because I don't have a strong foothold, but this is the beginning of gaining a therapeutic alliance. Uh, otherwise, um, this person has no use for me. Um, and they don't want me probing. They don't want me intruding. They don't want me anywhere near this. And so I'm using a situation here, crossing it, um, where um, actually she is the target. I mean, you want to be a heap. She's the target um, um, wittingly, and I'm interpreting her to here, ostensibly to help her. And I'm also showing her that I understand her because uh, um, I'm going to go further and say, does she have a hard time being interrupted when she's uh, concentrating? Does she get upset? Oh, yeah. Is that true? Okay. That's because uh, she gets hyper-focused, and she kind of goes into a little bit of a, uh, of a um, uh, 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 dissociative state. Uh, it's pleasurable, uh, because one thing you probably don't know about her is that she uh, finds relating with you and anybody important a little bit more stressful. Uh, 
and that allows her to calm down and relax. But I'm making this shit up, but but I'm going along with stuff, and every time she every time she nods and, and agrees, I'm using it. So let the record show that she agreed with all the stuff. If she agrees with all the stuff, um, uh, that creates a, s a situation where I can use it. And if she disagrees, I can say, "Well, remember what you said." Um, didn't she say that? Well, yeah. Uh, um, I don't know. Did I? Well, I have the video. You want to see it? No, I, that's okay. All right. So, so it's a trick. It's a trick to move the ball forward and get information uh, out quicker uh, than you ordinarily would um, with somebody who is uh, exquisitely uh, sensitive to approach, demand, and attack, uh, and exposure. And now I bypass that whole system by simply crossing it. Uh, and that's why you want to do this. All the things that uh, that I learned uh, in, in my uh, uh, being trained to work with personality disorders, I don't have to really employ so much because now I have a system where I can, I can use this crossing uh, and get away with things without having to do so much that I would have to do. This sort of takes care of all of that. Uh, and that's really cool. Um, uh, so does that make sense to everybody? I'm crossing the interpretation uh, and I'm doing that. And I'm watching all the while what they are doing. Um, I'm starting to collect tells. The very first thing I do is I start to get baselines of their faces, faces and expressions. I notice what they're wearing. I notice how they sit. I notice what they do with their hands. And I need the baselines because I need to compare and contrast when they're doing something different, when they're doing something different. So we'll laugh in the beginning. I'll talk about how beautiful that is. You know, when you start to notice things, you notice every detail, you become metrosexual. You start to fall in love with shoes and colors and all sorts of things. You know, I can't stop noticing things. You know, uh, it's very lovely, the colors and everything. Did you get that for her? Need it? Okay. Um, um, what makes her laugh, by the way? I just noticing that. You don't know. All right, so, <laughs> so we got to talk. You got, we got to talk. You guys, you guys don't know enough about each other after being together for that long. Um, <laughs> but, okay, so these are, the, these are techniques, and it's playful. I use a lot of humor. I, um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't mind being stupid sometimes. I can apologize for that. What I can apologize for is being afraid. There's nothing worse than a scared therapist because a scared therapist invokes fear in the couple or the patient, right? So I have to really manage that and I have to be fearless and, and to act a little more expansive in this venue, uh, like I had maybe like a, a, a drink in me. Um, and so I'm a, I'm a little looser but disciplined because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be an example of someone who can be themselves, make mistakes, and still hold the relationship, uh, you know, uh, the value of the relationship by fixing it and repairing it. Uh, that's, that goes a long way towards regulating them and demonstrating that relationships are not that brittle. Right? We can do stupid things, say stupid things, get it wrong, and just, I, you know, I've, I'm completely off on that. I, I just scratch that, forget it. Uh, you know, and that's no harm, no foul. Um, and so this is a, a place I, uh, almost there's no place I enjoy being better than, uh, than in my chair. I like it. I like being with my couples. And I can be with, uh, with people all day and feel energized because I've learned how to conserve energy and not work so hard and get them to work. Um, so let me show you something else. May I do it? Um, so one of the things, uh, we use a lot of trance work in PAC. Uh, can you move forward? It's very easy to get a couple in, in a trance. Um, that's if they're able to maintain eye contact. And if they can't, then you stop and you work there. Uh, but I'm going to have you guys stay in each other's eyes for a few moments um, and, uh, and not talk. And I'm actually looking for something, so there's a reason behind torturing you like this. So no talking, you can laugh, you can cry, uh, but stay in each other's eyes and go. I've got her heartbeat right there. I'm getting uh, of where they're breathing, from the chest or the belly, how they're holding their hands, whether they're matching or not matching, how often they're blinking, pupil size, whether th I can see controls on the face. And we divide the face uh, uh, lower, middle, and top. Each move uh, together, but also independently. She has a control on the lower part of the face. And so um, I wouldn't be s talking like this. Um, there's going to be a silence here to get them uh, focus on each other's eyes. This turns on the spotlight focusing of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. This is, uh, meditators know this, it takes about 10 minutes to, uh, to uh, s uh, quiet the noise. Um, and where I want to get them is where nothing else exists except them. 
Um, but I'm also forcing interactive regulation, which couples will, will fall into very quickly. When they're interactively regulating, uh, it's it serves as kind of a, a, a anesthetic. I can poke and prod and do surgery here without them going, ouch. And why would I want to do that? To follow up on hunches I have and to see if they're true, not true, to test and retest certain things. So I can start by just uh, checking. As you look at, as you look at um, Ofra's face, do you like the way she's looking back at you right now? She tilts her head, thinking. You feel neutral. Okay. Okay. And as you look at her, how is she taking th what you just said? How is she taking it? You think her eyes are getting glassy. Okay. Stay with her. Not in a marijuana scenario. Okay. That's interesting because why would she volunteer that? So I'm flagging it. Just saying, that's, that's flagged. And as you look at, I'm sorry, yeah, Kim, so, sorry. It's, oh, stay, 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 stay. They have to absolutely stay in each other's eyes. They cannot look. You don't want them, their eyes wandering and thinking. People can think while staying in each other's eyes, but they can't think with certain areas of the brain this way. You're disconnecting areas that obsess that, uh, that, that practice, that try to, uh, to formulate ideas based on prediction, you're dismantling it. Those areas, by the way, are the orbital frontal anterior cingulate. Two major areas that, uh, that predict, plan, um, restrict, inhibit, uh, and they use a ton of resources. So as you look at Kim, do you like the way she's looking back at you? What about the way she's looking back at you? Do you like? She seems, very warm. she seems very warm. Where do you see the warmth? I'm checking her equipment to see where she's looking. The upper half, she got that from me. Upper half of her face. Okay, you mean her eyebrow? Okay. All right. By the way, people on this spectrum often only look at the lower part. They look for cues on the lower part, which is driven by the autonomic nervous system, but also engages the central nervous system. The upper part of the face is almost entirely autonomic. Um, and so we get the mo more cues from the upper part than anywhere else. As you look at Ofra, tell her why you don't want to have sex with her anymore. <laughs> Keep looking at her. Don't look. Keep look, I don't want her thinking. You understand? And I'm, I'm doing all these things at once, but I'd be looking up and down. My eyes are darting back and forth. <laughs> Think of yourself as being a documentarian. The camera, if it doesn't see something, nobody sees it. If you didn't see it, it doesn't exist. So I have to watch rapidly what they're doing moment by moment, otherwise I won't catch them in the act of being themselves. Now, saying that under these circumstances should not cause a huge flinch because of the numbing effect, in a good way, of the interactive regulatory bond here. Um, they're actually holding each other, soothing each other. Uh, this would be like Peter Levine's well-placed touch, right? Um, it's, it has a calming effect uh, and, and uh, prevents a spiking, right? Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but it generally... Uh, so I can do things. Um, as you, as you look at Kim, tell her why you're not fully transparent with her. I don't trust her. As you look at her, how is she reacting to that? She's surprised. Hold on. Now what I'm not doing right now is saying a lot. Hold it. Because I'm looking in the spaces. Uh, people react to talking. So I try to look at the speaker after they finish talking, because then they show. Um, uh, and I, uh, but also, people start to uh, do things in the spaces, and they reveal themselves. Right? So you wait, and you hold, and you watch. Uh, is that true, what she said? Oh, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't. Tr I said I don't trust her. Um, uh, uh, do you know why she doesn't trust you? Crossing. Maybe you're not too sure. Okay. So those are qualifiers, and we listen for uh, for problems in speech. We don't track the the content. They could be talking about treasure or you know how to cure cancer. But, uh, but as soon as we see a shift or change, we're on it. We're looking for any shift or changes in them. Uh, that's the important thing, not steady state. But we're also listening for incoherent languaging. Incoherent mean uh, saying too much, little, not, uh, not being relevant, um, uh, not being understandable, right? Leading you around the bend, deflecting, um, and contradicting, okay? That's what we're scanning for. That's how we catch people who are not being truthful, or may not be truthful, may not be, okay? So she's using qualifiers here, which uh, either says that she doesn't know things, she doesn't have confidence in what she knows, she doesn't want to say, because it could get her into trouble. Could be a lot of reasons, I don't know what those are, but I'm gonna check, I'm gonna, you know, as soon as I have a hunch, I'm gonna test and retest and corroborate information, because I need evidence. In fact, we always move with proof. We, we look for evidence, and we only move when we have it. So we're collecting data, collecting data. I'm investigating, investigating. I'm inquiring, I'm, in, I'm interviewing more than I'm doing anything else because I need enough data to know what is this, what is going on, otherwise I'll move too fast and I'll make the wrong move, right? Uh, the couple system is highly complex. Um, it, is, it, is, it is phenomenological and intersubjective. Here's an example. This person um, uh, has a hard time making eye contact. Uh, I could think they have the problem. I have them look at me and they don't have a problem. I put them back and they have the problem. We find out that this person doesn't have a problem with eye contact, she does. And because of the system, the empathic system, she's gaze averting for her unconsciously. She's gaze averting uh, uh, because she knows there's only so long she can go. Do you understand? This is how tricky this is. Somebody comes in with a memory problem and they're 74 years old and they had three brain injuries, of course they have a memory problem. The other person is 45, but wait. They don't. The 45-year-old does. And it's not a memory problem. Um, uh, they're borderline. And so every, every threat um, uh, leads to misappraisal upon misappraisal. Um, and that appears like a memory problem, but it actually is, is a getting things wrong because uh, of emotional flooding and distorting reality. So uh, things are never what they seem in this work. Never. It looks like a duck, and it's a, and it's, and it's a frog. It's not even the same geno uh, a genus, right? Um, be prepared for that. And so we investigate, investigate the hell out of everything, even to granularity. Because words are misleading, we mostly misunderstand each other much of the time. Memory is, is terrible. Can't go by memory because memory is not reliable. And perception, like I said, is like a funhouse mirror. If, uh, if she gets activated, everything she sees, smells, hears, touches, is altered by her state of mind. Things are not the same. Remember, we've never lived outside of our heads, and we never will. It's all subjective, and it's all shifting and changing according to our state, uh, which is constantly being driven and interacted with by memory. So that's a problem for us, too. So we have to really be careful uh, in our assumptions, because uh, we can be wrong very easily. Okay, so I'll show you one other technique, because we were doing this, and I can go further, and I can uh, now I can move perhaps into uh, into an attachment interview, which is stressful, while they're in each other's eyes, uh, and go to early attachment uh, issues. Uh, and they're witnesses to each other, right? They're each other's, uh, you know, sort, sort of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, therapist in that sense. Um, but let's say, uh, let's say I'm dealing with both of them, and instead of, uh, instead of dividing and conquering, I need to deal with the system altogether, which is I'm gonna, I'm gonna wanna do mostly. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, go down the middle, in going down the middle, the target is in the center between them. And uh, let's say they're not looking at each other, but let's say they're looking, they're in that V formation, um, or they could be here, it doesn't matter. Uh, but I get, I, I find out that this person, uh, this person complains that, uh, that she lies. Um, this person um, does lie, but I'm leveling the playing field, and I find out that this person has lied too. Now I go down the middle. They're both liars. 
That's leveling the playing field. I'm always leveling it because I never want uh, one person to get too high and mighty or another person to feel like they're the problem. No angels, no devils, or there's one, there's the other. I know where to look in the opposite direction. Um, and so uh, down the middle levels automatically the playing field because both of you, it usually starts with the both of you, <laughs> both of you, the two of you, you're both, right? And it can be saying, you know, you're both lovely. Um, uh, I, I love how you guys, it, it can be appraising, uh, it can be an interpretive, or if I need to stop acting out, uh, them acting out, I need to stop something now, um, it can be, you know, uh, you know, you guys are, are lovely people. I really, I really, uh, very fond of both of you. Uh, however, t together you're shit. I mean, um, uh, I don't know where you got the idea that what you do is love. So in down the middle, because we're all the, the pack therapist is always aware and has to account for uh, voice, speed, gestures, movement, head tilting, moving forward, moving back. Uh, my eyes go down or center when I'm saying something that would be painful because um, I don't want either of them to think I'm addressing them specifically. I'm, uh, I, this is uh, equal uh, load bearing on the system itself and I'm basically confronting the system. This goes back to Tavistock, this goes back to Beyond, this goes back to I'm dealing, I'm addressing the system only. Uh, so, uh, you know, neither of you seem to want to do work today. Why? Uh, and this is how I steer the ship and how I stop something now or I start something now. Uh, very powerful intervention uh, going down the middle. Uh, you just need to know that you have the, the goods on both of them. You don't want to be caught. Uh, you know, I don't really have that information here. And then she could rightfully say, what do you mean weak, Kimisabi? I don't do that. Oh, you're right. Okay, so you just want to make sure you have that. And down the middle almost comes naturally when you're crossing. You're crossing and then, and then somebody was going to do something or say something that you just heard from the other person. It sounds like you both have a hard time getting close. It seems like neither of you know anything about each other. Why? Okay, so down the middle, crossing, uh, you know, cross-tracking uh, sounds easy, but it's uh, hard to remember to do, to train yourself to do. Once you do it, you start doing it everywhere. You get information <laughs> from your friends. You know, you're, you're, their, their, their partner will talk and you're looking over here and you're going, uh-oh. You know, because your, your eyes are open, you're picking things up, you're seeing things. That is pro-social, by the way. You, um, one thing I, s I was going to say about paying uh, super, super close attention to every detail is that um, we fall in love through the eyes. And we fall in love with that which we pay very close attention to. So you're going to fall in love with your couples. You're going to start to love people more because it does start to translate into attention. Right? That what we attend to, we understand, we like, we start to look for the baby in people, we start to, right? Um, and, uh, and so these skills are not just good in the, in the clinic, they're good everywhere, right? If you train yourself to, to do this. Um, and you're simply uh, paying attention, constantly watching, looking for any shift, any change, while relaxing your body, that's how we self-regulate. The biggest problem for therapists is not knowledge, is not intervention, it is self-regulation. The biggest problem. Um, getting your arousal too high or too low and then acting out your countertransference, doing something you ought not to do. In this work, um, we're dealing a lot with projective identification that's beyond the scope of today, but I'm always using that in terms of what is being held, what is being given to me in the way of uh, fantasy, thoughts, urges, impulses, feelings, uh, and I'm going to put that out into the system as quickly as possible. You cannot do that in individual therapy or family or group. In fact, the things that I can do in couple therapy and get away with, I cannot get away with if you add one more person in. They'll see what I'm doing. They'll see the trick I'm using. And so it doesn't work. Um, I can get away with a whole ton of things because I'm working with uh, uh, this uh, dyadic system as a third. And I can do all sorts of fancy things to lead, mislead, uh, to trick them to be strategic. Uh, and they'll never, they'll never uh, see it uh, happening. Now, most of my couples know I'm strategic and they actually like it. They like that I'm paying really close attention and they like that I'm being tricky. Uh, they count on it. Sometimes they ascribe things to me that I never thought of. You know, no, actually, I'm, I'm an idiot. I wasn't even thinking about that. Uh, but uh, but it, is, it is a loving thing if you're, if you're loving with your couple uh, and you actually intend for them to be healthy and to have a secure functioning relationship and you're pushing development forward. They understand that you care about them and, uh, and so I can yell at them. I can be very strong. 
uh, I can confront, and I can do all these things um, because they know my regard for them. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> thank you for being props. Okay, that, th that kind of thing, the crossing and down the middle, you can do now. You can start doing that. It doesn't take you doing PAC. Okay? It's, it's a good skill uh, to have um, and to keep your eyes moving and watch for any change that is occurring in front of you and then stopping the presses and checking it or flagging it uh, for later uh, checking. Okay, any questions before I move on, before I go any further? Anybody have questions? Cues for my A's. Could, could this approach be used between a parent and a child? Or yes, as long as the child is uh, mature enough, right? You don't want, you know, I did, I, you know, when I worked with mother infant pairs, uh, you know, uh, the way I worked was regulating the regulator. I would put the, the parents under stress with the baby, with the child, uh, videotape it, and then in another session play back the video and coach them. So, or help them intervene in the moment. So, uh, so you can do that. I think, it, I think working with uh, children is better served with the primaries there. Uh, and working with the primaries as they're under stress and you can engineer stress uh, so you can see leaks. Uh, and problems, and, and they're being able to regulate themselves and the child, and more importantly, each other, right, the couple. So yeah, you can, but in, in adult stuff, um, the way I deal with family therapy now is I divide and conquer. I, I divide them into dyads. That uh, ensures they'll come to therapy because it's hard to get everybody to come, but it also allows me to split people up into dyads and work with those relationships solely uh, without bringing everybody in and, and doing it that way. It works very well. Does that answer your question? You have amazing strategies, but at some point, if amazing what? I'm sorry. Strategies. Oh, yeah. I, I I think it's amazing what you're doing. At what point, though, does the couple, if they're not engaged in that, do you know? How can you feel like it's not going to work? Do they? If they're not engaged in what? Well, I mean, you have these strategies, and they're they're invested in this therapeutic process. But at what point do you feel like, well, this isn't going to work? they're not going to be engaged enough where they're not going to see change. Do you feel like that you can tell after a certain amount of sessions that it's not going to work for them or Never. they're not? No, no. Uh, uh, um, uh, for the therapist to fire the couple is a failure on the therapist's mm -hmm. part. We don't fire people. We get fired. We get fired. So they're the, one, they're the ones that Yeah, say if they don't like what I'm doing, they'll fire me. Right. But I'm, I'm confident that I did the right thing. I did what I'm supposed to do. Um, I stuck to my frame, my therapeutic narrative. Uh, you know, strategically, uh, what I was going for, uh, they couldn't do at this time. But many times people come back and they're able to do it. Uh, and a lot of people who've left therapy uh, end up referring everybody <laughs> to me. So uh, I think as long as you stick to your guns and you're doing what you're supposed to do, uh, you're not as concerned about that. Um, if people are not behaving themselves, not being collaborative or cooperative, that's acting out. And you have to be prepared to deal with an acting out uh, patient uh, or couple. Um, your job is to stop it um, because you can't do any therapy if they're acting out. Uh, the reason you can't is because they're employing, uh, they're employing uh, a, uh, a pain-avoiding ego, which is dumping everything that you're giving them uh, like a sieve, and uh, you know, they're not going to hold anything. So you can't really do therapy, uh, and you're not given permission to do therapy, and they're not uh, staying on the task of therapy, which is a third thing. That's we are here to work on our relationship, not each other or the therapist. We're here to work on the relationship. And, uh, uh, and so the therapist has to expect that they are fully collaborative and cooperative at every moment. So people can be that way for this moment, and next moment they're not. You have to be prepar prepared for these moments. This person's telling the truth, and they're completely clear, but wait for it, in the next five minutes they're lying. And so that's how people are, you know. Uh, uh, you're always uh, looking and watching to see, are they on track, are they on task? Um, are they collaborative? Are they cooperative? If not, then we have to go back to our interventions that get a therapeutic alliance. Anybody else before I move on? You can use your theater voice. Well, there's one abusive spouse. Good question. Okay, so a lot of people are emotionally abusive. Um, uh, if there is physical violence and I get wind of it, we're not talking about anything except that. And before we do anything else, you guys have got to convince me beyond a shadow of a doubt that I don't have to worry about you. Otherwise, we're not doing anything. And if you don't like it, you'll fire me. Uh, because uh, zero tolerance for that. But, um, but what are you going to do about people hiding stuff? 
Well, the whole thing about a strategic approach is knowing how to get information when people aren't forthcoming. And since we're, since we're getting information on several channels, right, not just verbal, um, uh, it's, it becomes very easy to see who's not talking or who's acting fearful, uh, who's doing uh, this or that. And then you do testing, you test, and you put them uh, in under pressure. Uh, and it, it will leak, it'll come out. So uh, anything I need to know, if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm doing uh, the work uh, properly, I should be able to find out soon. Doc. I should be able to find out soon. I think we have time for one more, Dr. Tang. Okay, yes, up here. Theater Thank voice. you. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, never mind. Um, do you at any point divide your couples to include individual sessions nope. and never to nope. do that? Nope. Mm. I can show you videos that say at the end, never do that. All my mistakes. Um, uh, this is, again, where you stick to your frame. You're a couple therapist uh, as long as you're operating as one. Uh, you don't become an individual therapist. You'll lose your case. Uh, it's complex already. Uh, now you're adding a level of complexity that you will not be able to see through. Uh, plus, people are boring alone. They have nothing to say to me that I can't hear with their partner. Um, I don't want to hear anything anyway. People are sane when they're by themselves. I want to see them crazy together. I'm dealing with the couple, not the individuals. So no, if they come to the waiting room and the other partner's not there, they sit in the waiting room until their partner comes. I, and when the one goes to the bathroom, I go to the bathroom. Um, I have one guy, one you know, well, t you know, because I don't want to be alone with either of them. Uh, I want one guy and and um, a head of a st major studio. Um, and kind of an asshole. And, uh, as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm next to him in the urinal, and he says, I hate my wife. She's a bitch, and I, I, I want to leave her. I'm thinking, fuck. <laughs> you know, dude, we're in the bathroom, okay? So as soon as I got in the room, I said, tell her what you told me. Uh, you know, there's no way. Uh, yeah, that's not how we do things. Um, uh, this is about being uh, completely... Uh, honest. This is about being completely forthright. Otherwise, um, uh, you're not a candidate uh, at that point for secure functioning. This is about being yourself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, back to our regularly scheduled program. And how much time do I have? Actually, only just a couple minutes. Ah, before. shoot. Damn it. Okay, let me show you a video of secure functioning. <laughs> if my wife were here, she said, I told you so. Too many slides. Can I show a quick video of an example of a secure functioning couple? Okay, just so you know, know that this is not a unicorn, um, here's an example of a secure functioning couple. That guy's a psycho. Been Volume? A psych so long, Volume? They come out of his lung. He sits around and do nothing all day long and harasses me. Can you guys hear? Sexually harasses me, huh? Sexually harassing. Yeah, that guy right there. Don't, don't start trouble with him. He's a psycho. He'll never do anything, man. Look, lunatic. That man's always around at night, and you're not here, so don't okay. start nothing. Well, I met Leanne through Lamp, but I met her because a guy was bothering her one day, and I just didn't. I don't like uh, people to take advantage of old people. And he was taking advantage of her, so I, I, I intervened. And, she didn't forget, and after that, she just kind of uh, adopted me as her fiance, and I've been her fiance ever since. That's been nine years ago, but then I started to, to like her as a person, and I started to uh, understand her, who she is right here, and her uh, mental illness with the collection of trash, and she has storages full of trash, like three different ones, just completely piled up that she pay every month, nothing but but that's who she is. And I take her just who, for who she is, and, and that's why she loves me, and I love her for that, and I accept her for that. I guess that's how I get my blessings from God, you know? Because in the beginning, it wasn't like that, but I truly, I would defend her with my life, dude. Believe that. I would die behind this little lady right here. <laughs> life, is, 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 life is a conundrum, you can believe that. So strange. And everybody down here knows that if they bother her today, they, they're going to have to deal with me. So they basically. She has intermittent don't explosive disorder, so they all. don't. They hate that she carries all that trash. 
<laughs> so that's what she likes, man. And it took me a long time that people, why you don't get her off the street and why you don't go to, she didn't want it. she doesn't want that. See, people don't understand. See, you have to let them be who they are. When she's ready to go inside, she'll go inside. When she wants to live on the street, you have to let her live, because a lot of times she likes to live on the street, even though she has an apartment. She leaves a trail like Linus everywhere she goes. Even though his mother's well set, the money he, she gave him, he spent on drugs. And then these people give him one drug knowing he'll have to buy more. They keep psyching him. And, and he almost finished his psychology course. And he went three years to medical school. He had to drop out medical school. He'd crack like it up so bad. Couldn't remember anything. And now he's thinking about going back to medical school, even though he has pancreatic cancer, which is really a sick mood. Is he a good fiance? Yes, he is. Um, we have uh, examples uh, upon examples of people with personality disorders, mental illness, brain injury, uh, uh, autism, and their secure functioning. Uh, if they can do it, your couples can do it. Uh, you just have to expect it, uh, otherwise they won't, right? So we really do think that secure functioning is the way to go, not just for couples, but for everybody. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get more into the working with the addictions part. Um, I guess I didn't plan well. Um, but good luck with your couples, and it was a pleasure talking Thank to you. Thank you very today. much.